and introduce the amazing Kieran O'Reilly. Thank you so, so much for joining us. And let me just promote you to a panelist very quickly. And you may, you may have to unmute the, uh, the mute button on the bottom left. That seems to be a consistent issue with Zoom these days. And also the other thing that all viewers can do. Oh, there you are, Kieran. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. <laughs> it's great. Where are you geographically? Oh, oh I'm right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No worries. Uh, <laughs> need to know basis. Radio. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, so, I'm um, for those who don't aren't aware of your amazing activism, I just want to, you know, condense a really brief, brief summary uh, just in relation to WikiLeaks. You've been there from the beginning, before Julian Assange even entered the embassy, supporting him, and have done amazing work in in the cause for Julian. So, can you describe for us that process and what you've experienced and how you feel about the situation right now? Uh, well. Uh... I've, I'm, I'm from a, a Christian pacifist movement called the Catholic Worker, and I'm talking to you from our farm community outside of London, where we offer hospitality for destitute, uh, undocumented women, refugees, and children. And uh, the other part of the work we do is nonviolent resistance to war. And uh, on the day Julian was initially detained, which is eight years ago, he's been detained for eight years, confined for nearly six in England. We were outside the U.S. Embassy holding a vigil because some of our people in the United States were being sentenced for a nonviolent disarmament action on the Trident nuclear submarine. And it came over the radio that Julian had reported to, from memory, Kentish Town Police Station. And um, although I'd not met him personally before, I'd heard about him and we were both, when he had previously been an activist before he became a, a journalist and publisher. Some people actually move on from this stage in their lives, but uh, I'm still an activist um, primarily. Uh, we'd worked uh, in, with hundreds of others on the S uh, S11 blockade of the World Economic Forum in Melbourne in 2000. And um, I imagine he was doing techie stuff and I was getting beaten in the streets by the police uh, for blockading uh, the Davos Foundation, uh, Bill Gates and friends uh, who were gathering there. And um, so also Julian would have grown up in the anti-war movement in Australia. He's about 10 years younger than me. And uh, he was also born in Townsville, Queensland, um, which is uh, 1,200. 1,200 miles north of Brisbane, where I was born. And Townsville was a kind of military town, but there was a bit of a rainbow region um, on an island, Magnetic Island, I think, uh, off Townsville, where he grew up in his early years. And uh, I can't see you now. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can. I was just taking a, a drink of water. I'm back. That's all right. I'm Hello. right here. I'm trying to get my nicotine caffeine balance right here myself. So I've got coffee. <laughs> totally, <here>. totally understandable. Um, <laughs> takes me a while to wake up in the morning. Um, so uh, that would have been part of, part of his background. Uh, when I was 17, I guess he was seven, uh, the state government suspended all civil rights in Queensland. So that's partly where I guess his commitment to free speech and free expression comes from. Um, anyway, so receiving this news that had been taken to custody and I think it was December 7th, 2010, uh, I made my way rapidly to Horse Ferry Courts near Westminster. Um, and when I arrived and I ran, not as fit as I used to be, um, there was a large, I'd say 120, 130 people. And it took me a few minutes to realise um, that 95% of them were media. Um, and there were five or six other sympathisers there. And, uh, um, yeah, it was kind of presidential proportions in terms of media coverage. And um, so I worked out where should I be with such a captive audience, and I've, I've got a long history of soapbox speaking. So I got up and started to address the media about its responsibilities to a fellow journalist who was being detained without charge and... Um, so, yeah, I don't know how many people in that audience appreciated my input, but um, they had to stay there because they were waiting to get 
the photo of Julian being Julian being released on bail, which didn't happen. They denied bail, and he was taken to Wandsworth Prison, and that's where the state, Ameri- you know, the US Empire, wants him offline in solitary. Um, so that lasted about ten days, and I, I gathered a few Australians and London together, and we occupied the foyer of the Australian Embassy, and uh, spoke out. Because Prime Minister Gillard, Labor Prime Minister, had offered to take his passport off him um, on the first day. So when people start to complain about Ecuador, the Australians sold him out on the first day, you know, and uh, Ecuador's last nearly six years. So um, uh, she was stopped from doing that by her foreign minister, Kevin Rudd, who who was formerly prime minister, and she rolled, and then he later rolled her, long story. But... um, uh, and I'm not sure Kevin was committed to the principles of things or whether this was just a little bit of tension for him to explore with uh, with, with uh, Prime Minister Gillard. So that's one thing we did. And then Julian was brought again to the Horse Ferry Courts. And it's the only time the Stop the War group uh, did anything for him, um, which is amazing because they did nothing for Chelsea Manning. And um, they're all celebrating all the WikiLeaks exposures of the Iraq and Afghan war. But... Um, uh, and they mobilised 200 people outside. So they had the capacity to do that. And then they pretty much dropped him at that point. And the next week he was brought to the High Court where he uh, was granted bail, um, a large I mean, 160 grand or something, uh, but also very restrictive bail, an- uh, electronic ankle bracelet. Um, yeah, he was under house arrest, I believe, uh, for a, a long time before yeah, and, he went into the embassy. Was, up country somewhere, and um, that uh, he had to report to the police station every day. So his, lim- his movements were quite limited. Um, so I was there at the High Court, uh, and um, then I heard on radio that he was being moved. His next court appearance was uh, at Woolwich, and that's very suspicious because Woolwich is a court that was built for the provisional IRA and for later used with Islamic jihadists. It's where terrorist cases occur, and it's got wow. an underground tunnel from that court into Belmarsh Prison, which is a Category A prison, it's where a lot of the IRA prisoners were kept in the 80s and 90s. And uh, inc- wow, that's incredible that the the comparison between WikiLeaks and and terrorism ha- goes back that far. I didn't know that. That's yeah, mind blowing. So it was very, I think, conscious setting to put him there. So uh, I remember Rush just hearing it on the radio and rushing over and there were about five other people there. And um, as Julian finished his appearance, uh, uh, he was driving out and uh, uh, someone was driving and he stopped the car and got out and thanked us for coming and stuff. So that's the first time I'd met him. And I said, look, look, mate, I'm from Brisbane, Australia. And he said, you've come a long way. You know, I was based in London at the time. And um, then... Then there were two more appearances or two days of appearance uh, in front of a magistrate at Woolwich and I had a bit of time to organise and we got about 30, 40 people there and there was obviously a big media scene and uh, the magistrate at that point uh, ruled that he should be extradited to Sweden on the basis of merely a police officer signing an arrest, European arrest warrant. And then... I think Julian kind of realised uh, who I was from memory because I had a pretty high profile in the first Gulf War. I served 30 months in jail in the United States uh, with three other people, um, Moana Cole from New Zealand, uh, Bill Strite and Sue Frankel. We managed to get into a US Air Force base and with simple household hammers disable a B-52 bomber. Um, unfortunately, other B-52s that could still fly were then deployed to England after we were initially jailed and they dropped napalm cluster bombs and dual explosives. So I think Julian at that point remembered that and uh, he invited me to his 40th birthday party. So um, by this stage, I was working very closely um, with a former SAS soldier who'd been in Iraq, had been in uh, Afghanistan, the Paris, had done three tours in Northern Ireland and a tour of Macedonia, who'd had a crisis as a soldier. Um, with what they were asked or being ordered, not asked, <laughs> ordered to do in Iraq. And, um, uh, uh, so 
uh, he he refused to deploy to Iraq, Ben Griffin, who went on later to create Veterans for Peace in the UK. So Ben and I attended um, that party. I, the first guy we met when we pulled up was uh, an Icelandic man who we didn't know but was working for the FBI at that stage, uh, who did the kind of initial security on us and um, and then, you know, had more time to meet and, and, and meet Julian. So later... Um, he was taken to the high court and at this point he gets Gareth Pierce as a lawyer and Gareth is very celebrated in Ireland, especially as she represented a lot of Irish people framed in England, the Guildford Four, the Birmingham Six, the Maguire Seven. And if you see the film, The Name of the Father, that's about the Guildford Four. And um, so Gareth's a very you know, incredibly talented solicitor and also a great human being and, uh, painfully humble and saintly. <laughs> and, um, so. It's amazing how WikiLeaks brings uh, those people together so much. Uh, you, you really find the most incredible human beings, including yourself, standing up for WikiLeaks consistently and Julian Assange. And I really want our viewers to understand the uh, the level of commitment that you have shown uh, in, in uh, standing up and, and showing solidarity with Julian and the group that you work with. Um, I, you've been there for eight years and it's just incredible the persistence and commitment you've shown before Julian Assange was, was gagged in the way that he is right now. Yeah, so then, um, you know, I was helped found a Catholic worker house in Haringey in an, an abandoned church. So it was a great venue and we had... Um, Lots of public meetings around Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange there. Um, people like Peter Tatchell, a very celebrated gay human rights, gay rights, human rights act activist in England, spoke there. Um, would combine music with speeches, and and um, we and Ben launched Veterans for Peace from there. It was a really good venue, and we operated from there for three years uh, in terms of solidarity with Chelsea and with Julian, um, and then. Uh, WikiLeaks approached me about providing kind of security for Julian to get him into court and out of court. Uh, basically, the media want a freak out shot of someone going into court, and um, and yeah, our job was to get him through this kind of milieu of photographers and uh, safely in and out. So we met we met um, through that again, and. Um, and the High Court uh, ruled against him. And then the following year, the final appeal, I think, was the British Supreme Court. And once again, at all these court appearances, we'd um, provide an anti-war context for the reason why he's being persecuted. And um, we would also sing uh, that Dylan song, I Shall Be Released, whenever he came into court, which is a very, very nice way of expressing solidarity rather than screaming and chanting. Um, so that became a bit of the song for the solidarity movement around Julian in England. Hopefully Bob doesn't sue. But, <laughs> but um, and then, yeah, the Supreme Court, I remember it was zero degrees for two days and I'm from subtropical paradise, Brisbane. And, um, and they again ruled against him and... Uh, then I went back to Australia uh, to see my mother, basically, when he had his final court appearance, um, which I think he didn't make because he got caught in traffic. But it was a very rapid reading by the Supreme Court that they weren't going to change their opinion. So while I was back in Australia for two or three months <clears throat> um, and helping organise solidarity there, um, Julian entered the Ecuadorian embassy um, and initially, uh, I think it was William Hague, who was a foreign minister, threatened to invade the embassy, um, which, of course, is against, I believe, international law, but definitely international tradition and agreements. And um, from that point on, they circled the embassy 24-7 with uniformed police. And we, over the course of three years, they spent £11 million pounds, um, They've gone on to spend, they're spending more on covert surveillance, et cetera. Uh, so this recent kind of guardian, uh, you know, what, as they say in Ireland, what do you expect from a pig but a grunt from the guardian? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah that's a very apt analogy for sure, <laughs> definitely. So they, the recent uh, attacks about, you know, the waste of Ecuadorian expenditure 
I think it was three or four million pounds, three million, I think. You have to put that in the context of, of the London Metropolitan Police spending 11 million pounds in a much shorter period over three years, and also the threat by a government to invade your embassy. So, I mean, they were basically under siege, and you guys, you and your, the people that stand with you have been in the centre of that storm this entire time. Yeah, but just to show how disingenuous the British media is, that context of the threat by the British government to invade the embassy, their expenditure outside the embassy weighed up against the security measures the Ecuadorian government felt it had to take at that embassy. Um, so, yes, yeah, so at the beginning, there was 24-7 vigilance around the embassy by people from Occupy and others. And um, then I, I was in Australia and I was kind of advising, like, this, this looks more like a marathon than a sprint at the moment. Um, so let's work out what can we sustain over the long haul. So those discussions were had internally. And um, over the years, it was a daily vigils, and then now, it's um, it's it has been three afternoons, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, three to five, and also a group on Saturday from about eleven to five. Um, so it's been you know people like Clara who lived through the Chilean coup um, has sustained that for six years. Uh, there are other Colombians who've been tortured. One man was actually shot in the head by death squads who come to the vigil. Uh, Emmy's got her own Greek junta background experience, you know, living through that. All uh, of the, that is such important background for people to understand. Yeah. You know, and then really... there's been very little, a uh, few English activists. Um, they did such a good job, The Guardian, at undercutting any liberal left support that would naturally have flown his way. And uh, they've been the most effective medium at marginalising. So, um, yeah, I mean, from my tradition, uh, being a radical Catholic anarchist pacifist, um, to vigil is to to stay awake while society slumbers to danger. And so it's an, an odd thing because usually when you rock up to a uh, embassy, people want to shout and, <laughs> and um, protest. But we're we're actually there for five years, uh, supporting the embassy, supporting uh, the courage of Ecuador and the embassy to offer asylum, which they granted to Julian after an investigation. And um, we had some pretty big days when the Ecuadorian foreign minister visited. And uh, we had a yeah, great scene. I think it was an Ecuadorian musician flew in from Amsterdam. He was, so he'd play a song. And then we had a Kiwi blues guitarist, uh, John McLean, uh, who'd respond with a song. So uh, it was quite celebratory that day, I remember. And um, also on occasion, maybe four occasions, um, Julian has addressed uh, the crowd from the balcony. Um, now all this is is uh, is banned. Um, so I think we're now entering a period where it's become a sprint again rather than a marathon. And uh, and I can see that clearly by the escalation in police presence. That's so, exactly what I was going to ask you about. My next question for you was absolutely going to be what you've witnessed as far as that escalation since Julian Assange has been cut off from communication with the outside world. Because I know that WikiLeaks tweeted a few days ago um, showing images of these very overt police uh, marked vehicles and et cetera, which, which, as you said before, it had been a covert operation for a number of years. So uh, um, There's always been a parallel operation between visible and covert. When the visibles were removed um, was just before the UN ruled that what Britain was doing was illegal and arbitrary detention. And so I, I, a coincidence, I think not. You know, That's amazing happening. timing. I have never, nobody's pointed that out before. That's totally new information. Thank you yeah. for giving us that context. Okay. So to cut a long story short, um, I was returned from Australia last year. I was based in Dublin. And I, I basically came over for a football match. Australia was playing Colombia. We're in the World Cup, unlike the United States. And they were having a friendly game at Fulham. So I met quite a few Colombians vigiling outside the embassy and they said, why don't you come to this game? So I said, all right, I'll come over and visit a few people for a week or two. But around that day uh, in late March, a uh, day after the US military had been in Ecuador for negotiations, the internet was jammed, the phone was jammed, and visitors were denied. Now, 
I've spent two years in prison collectively in various jurisdictions for nonviolent anti-war activity. And as a former prisoner, I can say that some of my conditions were worse than Julian's, but some were better. And what Julian is experiencing is sensory deprivation. Um, no change of temperature, heat, light. You never see more than five metres. That affects your eyesight, uh, lack of stimulation. Um, and sensory deprivation is designed to destroy people, you know. And uh, so I've, over the years, visited Julian in the embassy and I've seen a deterioration in his health and... Um, so it's one thing um, being locked up for six years, confined for six years, detained for eight. But the most important thing for a prisoner is to have an outdate, to know how much time you're doing. Um, and that's why in, when you're in prison, the most chaotic sections of the prison is remand, where people don't know what the outdate is. Um, so that kind of heaviness of thinking, because also in confinement, and I've been detained and confined with our prison walls. I've been detained with a gun to my head. I've been detained merely by a threat of a cop saying, you move five metres and I'll bash you. You don't need, people are saying, oh, this is not imprisonment or this is not detention. Now, exactly. my, my definition of detention is the state draws a line. They say, you step over that line, a lot worse is going to happen to you. So this That's is, such a critical point. Um, so the sensory deprivation is... There's actually a documentary, I think it's called the Lexington Control Unit, and they put three radical prisoners underground in Kentucky for a year, and you just see how they age so rapidly over that year, three women. Um, that's worth looking at in terms of sensory deprivation. Um, so, yeah, so it looked urgent, and I was asked to move down near the embassy, which I did in this very ritzy hotel, and <laughs> look... <laughs> Looking the way I do, you know, the staff would think I was some homeless guy trying to access the buffet or something. So that was an interesting experience. And then um, I, I ended up doing a 25-day, 8 to 10-hour vigil a day um, with others joining me and also the regular th three afternoon vigils happening. And that was quite an interesting experience because after about a week, people started talking to me like... Um, uh, this is a very wealthy area. Like, this is not just British wealth, it's global wealth. And um, uh, so, you know, chauffeurs, uh, an Iraqi chauffeur would stop every day and buy me a coffee. Um, uh, some of the people living there, incredibly wealthy. Um, Jose Mourinho walked by the other day, uh, manager of Manchester United. You know? <laughs> wow. But, um, um, so... And also, you know, very high-class sex workers and um, all those who service the rich and powerful, I guess, in whatever way they do, and Harrods workers. So, you know, the credibility of being there uh, had a resonance with with people. And um, so I think the situation is so urgent that tomorrow, Monday, June 4th, I'm going to resume that um, a daily, all-day daily vigil. Um, and I, I, and also we're organising an event for June nineteenth, and I've asked friends in Australia, and they're organising similar presence outside British consulates in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane. Some people I don't know in Adelaide, and uh, people taking their own initiative across the United States and Europe, and um, so. And that's so yeah. important. I, I would ask you um, to. Explain, well, I'll, I'll let the viewers know that the, the June 19th date is so significant because that's the day that is the anniversary of Julian entering the embassy. But right. could you, uh, Kieran, please tell us how we can get more information on that if people want to participate or start their own um, event for that? Uh, what is the website or, or Twitter handle? And if you don't have it on the, on the top of your tongue, it's totally fine. I'll, I'll just grab it from you later and right. put it into chat because I, I, I genuinely want people to have access to that because I know so many people ask us when we do this, when we report on your work or when we report on the situation with Julian, they just go, well, how can I help though? Like maybe they're not in the UK and they're not traveling to the UK. They say, what, what can I do? And I think you are an ex and, and the people that you work with on a regular basis at the oh. embassy are such an exemplary example of taking these matters into your own hands and making a real difference by doing that. Yeah, I mean, I always quote 
um, Judy Small, who was a feminist folk singer in Australia in the 70s, <clears throat> and she had a great lyric that said, uh, because we can do little, we do nothing at all, you know. And I, exactly. That's, yeah. that's the thing we're facing up against, I think. So how do you get people to understand that they have to do something and what do you think that they can do if they are not in a position to come in and stand at a vigil with you? Okay, this is... Um, I Googled Judy recently. Apparently she's a federal court judge now, so go figure. But anyway, so... Um, <laughs> the irony. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. <laughs> so, but it's a great lyric, so trust the tale and not the teller. Um, uh, I would, as a former prisoner, um, I can't overemphasise that simple, what you would consider minuscule acts of solidarity, the significance of that, to the prisoner. So it's six years of Julian entered the embassy, but it's also six years of confinement, been detained for eight, confined for six. Um, the simple act of receiving a letter, and I've been with Julian in the embassy when he's opened letters, and you can see the nourishment that brings. And, and you know, I was in jail. I was arrested in New York State. They put me on con air. They flew me to El Paso. They bust me up to jail in Pecos, Texas, Judge Roy being territory. And I was the only gringo white boy in the jail. There were 24 of us in a cage, six cages in one room. And those cages were open 16 hours a day. So I was in a room with 140 men. And the first month was very difficult. I was getting assaulted, spat out, et cetera, basically because of my looks rather than my race. Now, what can literally save my ass in that situation was the amount of mail I got, how many correspondence I got, you know. So we have to as a movement, if we're a serious movement, we're going to have prisoners, you know, and the Catholic worker movement I come from, we've had anti-war prisoners since World War II, you know. Um, Dorothy Day, who started our movement, who the Catholic Church are now trying to canonise, uh, was a suffragette in World War I, was in prison. So we have a lot of experience with an awareness of the significance of solidarity. We don't all have to be confined or detained and imprisoned. What we all have to do if we're part of a movement is support our prisoners, support our people before the courts. So um, people might think, oh, it's only me and Budapest or somewhere. And um, you only need one person, you know. And, exactly. Uh, and I often find when I'm standing there by myself that the public often engage me more. Maybe they feel sorry for me. I don't know. But um, you have conversations and things. And uh, so that's worth doing. Uh, we In London, we're going to have a main event at 6 p.m., 6 to 8. Um, and then uh, it's going to be preceded by a vigil from 11. But we're hoping most people will assemble at 6 if they can. And uh, we're hopefully, uh, yeah, we're going to have music and we're going to have reflection and speakers um i know in dublin we've organized an event and claire daly who just mentioned will be speaking at it she's fantastic a member of parliament um mick wallace also irish parliamentarian and also nobel peace prize winner marie mcguire will be speaking at that event and that's at the british wow. embassy tuesday june 9th 6 p.m in dublin um and uh so yeah we're chasing a few um High profile people. I, I just got an email from John Filger. I was hoping he'd come, but he's in Sydney addressing a rally. Um, um, Alex Cox, the director, Repo Man, um, Sid and Nancy, he got back to me. He's in London a week later and we'll come down to the embassy for a vigil. Um, so, you know, uh, and then I'm, I'm approaching um, this young, young man who read, he was in the British Navy. He was. Uh, um, read WikiLeaks and then was told to deploy to Afghanistan and said, well, after, what after I read, this is an immoral war. And uh, he refused to deploy and he was put in military prison here and we went up to visit him and raise money for his wife so she wouldn't be evicted. Um, so he doesn't live in London, So, but I'm, I'm going to ask him to come along. Um, so it'll be good. It'll be a good scene in London. It'll be a good scene in Dublin and, and Brisbane, um, four to six in Brisbane. Uh, at the Anzac Shrine in Sydney, there's two events. There's a rally on the Sunday at 1 p.m., June 17th, outside Sydney Town Hall or Sydney Town Square or whatever. And then friends are going to the British Consulate on Tuesday in Sydney from 9 to 1. In Melbourne, I believe, it's 12 noon to 2 p.m. at the British Consulate. And, um, yeah, so there's a Facebook page. I mean, when I met, um, 
the, one of the big frustrations of this is I'm not at all techie, as you've discovered, trying to get me on. No, with. no, no, not a, I am not either. I consider myself a complete Luddite, like not, okay, not technical yeah. at all, so I understand. Yeah. My, my medium is grabbing a piece of cardboard, writing something on it, standing in the street, and um, so I, when I met Julian, I remember he advised me not to go on Facebook, and I said, Look, mate, I don't know much about this internet stuff. I think you do. I'll take your advice. But apparently there's a Facebook page up there uh, listing all the um, all the events happening on June 19th. So that's Awesome. Easy. Yeah. Fantastic. And I want to return as well to the point you made earlier about the, the effect that mail, that receiving letters has on people that are uh, confined or imprisoned, because that was actually a point that was also uh, brought up really specifically and strongly by John Kiriakou earlier in the segment, and specifically in relation to his own experience in prison and the effect that receiving letters had on him. So I think that I hope that people uh, really take that seriously, that that, will, that is a huge, huge thing to do that will really help Julian get yeah, through the has, situation. It's two-dimensional. One is it nourishes the prisoner. There's a whole system there to, forget you're for, uh, to convince you you're forgotten, uh, trying to defeat you to get you to recant. And the second thing it does, it sends a message to those confining you. That, um, and that, when, that was my experience in Texas. After the correspondence came in, the, the screws or the guards um, stopped uh, picking on me and making life miserable for me. They backed off because, and they probably went on to pick on someone else. You know, but, yeah. <laughs> but uh, because they felt I had reach outside the jail. And jail exactly. Is, you weren't forgotten. You weren't just, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, you know, jailers and Julian, you know, hopefully he won't, but he may end up again in jail. Uh, jail is, it's a whole totalitarian world unto itself. They don't want anyone looking that way and um, out of sight, out of mind. And, uh, and, and, and simple correspondence is, um, is a really strong anti-venom to that isolation. Um, so I think we have to translate. I think, to me, I could be wrong, but the internet should be a means to, to an end of physical activity, whether that's standing in the street with a sign or whether that's writing a letter from your home to, to Julian. Um, yeah, there has to be some product after this kind of Twitter flurry. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's very important. And people make all sorts of great interventions. It can be quite pranksterish and, um, uh, you know, like I and, and Boris Johnson was over there because they still haven't sorted out Brexit and the Irish border. And so I heard he was coming and I just texted a few friends, anywhere, anyone know anywhere where he'll be? And, I, and that next morning it said, he's already there, he's at the Foreign Affairs Department. So I just grabbed a banner by myself and literally ran into town and uh, held this banner. I was being harassed. I was by myself being harassed by a special branch. And um, this young garter, young cop comes up to me and goes, I don't want to put you in handcuffs. And I was like 20 or something. And I said, <laughs> Oh, it's in handcuffs before you're born, mate. You know? <laughs> anyway, so eventually, uh, you know, Boris Johnson comes out with his special branch bodyguard, and I go, Mr. Johnson, you've detained Julian Assange without charge for eight years in your country. Um, the UN has ruled this illegal and arbitrary. So I got that out before the special branch jumped on me, and Johnson, a look at the shock on his face, you know, these powerful people, once they're confronted, they just melt. And then recently we are outside of Chogham, our Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, and um, uh, just three of us. And all of a sudden I looked to my right, and who should it be but Alexander Downer, the uh, High Commissioner, looking at the banner. So I just turned around and went, Mr Downer, just the man I want to see. And I was waiting to jump in front of the Prime Minister's limo, uh, Turnbull, but, but you can't really blockade one person, and, uh, you know, so you have to grab them, so I'm not willing to do that. So... Um, so I walked along with him for about 25 metres saying, you know, you've been totally negligent in your role here in London. Um, why don't you go and visit Julian? You know, when, when I was in jail in Texas, uh, the Australian consulate in Houston came up to visit me, you know, and um, he cynically turns around and goes, uh, he's an Ecuadorian citizen now, which is, of course, total bullshit. Like, he's also an Australian citizen. And even if you believe that, what were you doing for the last three and a half years and, and your exactly. job as high commissioner? And so the they sent this, the British special branch out and um, 
this Australian federal police woman. And she goes, um, oh, have you been in London? What's your name? And I said, well, what's your name? And she said, Narelle, a very Australian name. And I said, well, welcome to London, Narelle. And she goes, thank you. And she says, have you been in London long? And I said, I've been around, Narelle. And uh, we kept asking questions. And I said, Narelle, I think there's a serious uh, issue of trust in our relationship, given your <laughs> professional capacity. Um, <laughs> so why don't you do That's Google amazing. Me? So off she went and she Googled me. And then she was very excited to be in London, I think, basically. And um, the special bra- British special branch wasn't as friendly. But strange, much more friendly. But, but, you know, but uh, this is the type of, of event and, and, like, sort of positivity almost that is missing from so many, like, the from the view of even supporters of Julian Assange. We get so much bad news that, and we... Uh, we have this news cycle that that leaves Assange behind. So the many, many positive acts uh, by you, by the people that work with you, and uh, by Claire Daly, and these similar things just kind of uh, get sort of forgotten and slip through the cracks. And I think that when we discuss all of them together, it becomes really clear how much support Julian Assange has. And I think it's important to review this type of um, support and action that you have all participated in. I'd like to make two points. One is everything you do in life has two dimensions. One is actual and one is symbolic. So if you feed a hungry person a bowl of soup at a homeless shelter, that's an actual thing. It'll put off the hunger pains for five hours or six hours. But it's also symbolic of the whole world being fed outside market forces, you know. So everything you do, when we disabled a B-52 bomber, that put a killing machine, a specific killing machine out of action back in '91. And we did the same again in Ireland in 03 uh, to a US war plane. But it has a symbolic dimension of a world that lives without weapons of mass destruction like B-52s. Um, the other thing is there's two sorts of actions, and I've been active for 40 years now. There's one like we'll do on June 19th, but we have to tell people it's happening. Um, we have to get speakers and do all that kind of work, right? The other thing is non-violent intervention, where Boris Johnson's in Ireland to talk about Brexit, you find him and you intervene. It would have been helpful if I'd had a photographer with me or something, you know, um, or, or with Alexander Downer. Um, these are called non-violent interventions, where the state actually tells people these events are on, they set the scene, and you go and intervene. And I know this clearly because I was very involved with the East Timorese. I lived with East Timorese in Liverpool for three years. Some had had their parents killed in front of them. Some had been tortured. Um, and East Timor was off the radar, uh, I'd say from 1976 to 1991, in its neighbouring country, Australia. Like even the Australian Catholic Church didn't do anything. And there was a genocide of Catholics just next door, you know, maybe because they weren't white, they weren't prioritised. But... Um, you know, that that changed with uh, Max Stahl courageously filming the massacre in the Delhi Cemetery, John Pilger making Death of a Nation, put it back on the radar. And you knew, and we, we were very involved very early in the early 90s, uh, confronting the training of Indonesian troops near Brisbane at Kanangra, uh, the Petros Mining Company illegally drilling gas or whatever in Timor Sea. But we knew we had a movement when these people who were responsible for this genocide and Australia's complicity in it the Prime Minister, Foreign Affairs Minister, could not go out in public with at least one person yelling out, what about East Timor? And that should be the case now. The Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, who once defended a whistleblower in the um, spy catcher case in the 80s, should be reminded of that. And Julia Bishop, the Foreign Minister, should not be able to go out in public in Australia without one person yelling out, what are you doing for Julian Assange, an Australian citizen, being denied human rights and due process in Britain, you know. So that's when you know you have a movement. And um, you can never measure the effect. It's like, you know, the young boy saying the emperor has no clothes, you know. It, um, it really is, you know. So, um, you know, opportunities will arise in London. Donald Trump's coming over here. Um, you know, the, you just have to be always aware of opportunities to raise the issue. And with nonviolent intervention... It doesn't take putting out lots of leaflets and telling people something's on. It's that they already know it's on, you know. So, and you can develop. You would need to develop a community of resistors, um, and uh, also to celebrate together. And we, we had a, a big open day here at the Catholic Worker Farm yesterday, and people from the vigil at the embassy came up. We had good music, good food, 
uh, very multicultural and um, and you know many of the women living here have fled American wars in Syria and in Africa and and elsewhere. So you know it's very directly linked. Absolutely, just incredible. And I, I want to return as well to the to the. Uh, I know I asked you about this earlier, but but the escalated police presence that you've seen just in the last few weeks at the embassy. Um, can you describe that to us and how it's different from from what has been the norm in the, the operation at the embassy? Well, there's lots of different policing. Um, there's There was a visible uniform police that was stationed 24-7, 10 of them. Some of them were in the building because the international territory is only the five rooms of Ecuador and five rooms of Colombia, the rest of its private residence. Then you had uh, the embassy and in, in a, this might come as a shock to Americans, but British police are generally not armed like Queensland they are. They've got a taser on one hip and a gun on the other. Um, then you have these red vehicles, which are embassy uh, policing, and they're armed. And you've got to be careful because these people, they like shooting people. You know, they, that's what they're trained for, and it's a bit of status to get a notch on your gun and stuff. So you've got to be very careful. Um when confronting these people. Um, then you've got covert surveillance there, and you've also got very wealthy people on that street um, from the Middle East, from Russia, from all over the world, and they hire there's a uh, former special forces people to be their bodyguards, okay? And you can see these guys stand like military, they move like military, and they're doing, if not paid, surveillance of the embassy and formal surveillance. I remember I took Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys into meet Julian, and um, he was unfashionably late, and I just I was standing there, <laughs> fashionably late, and I was standing there, and this guy, I looked over my right, and the guy was standing in a military posture, um, probably late 40s. And then this other guy walked up, and he was obviously military, and he put his face right in my face, you know. And these British soldiers, they could smell a patty, you know. They could smell anyone from Ireland uh, and just try to intimidate me, you know. And I'm like, all right, can I help you? <laughs> you know? um, so there, there are people working in that field who've done some very terrible, dark stuff. And they, once you leave Special Forces, all these private companies are offering you big money to do this kind of work for corporations and for wealthy individuals. So um, the problem often with our movement is that we don't take ourselves seriously and take each other seriously. You can bet the state takes us very, very seriously. You know? That's so, an incredible point, definitely. And, and, uh, and that's why we have to be careful with our relationships in the movement and make sure we keep, you know, we're all going to always screw up and not be punctual and let each other down and all that. So we've got to be continually uh, forgiving of each other and being forgiven, got to get over your pride and your fear to do that and uh, to keep a rock band together, let alone a social movement. And um, Exactly. So well, and that, that speaks to the spirit of what we're doing here with this vigil is trying to build those connections instead of tearing them down and just existing no. in other local chambers. That's exactly the, the aim here. No, so. you're, doing, you're, doing, you're doing great work here, you know, and um, we all have different gifts. My gifts is the ability to stand endlessly in the street, you know, and talk to strangers, you know. That's effort. Talking to strangers is effortless. Lee, it's effortless for me, you know, my father's son who talked to a lamppost. I, um, for some people, it's very stressful. So you don't ask them to do that if, if it's stressful. Some people are great musicians. To play a song is not stressful at all. You know, for me to play a song would be major stress, you know. so Exactly. You just exactly. And I think, yeah, the public seems to think that the, uh, a one, there's a one-size-fit-all answer to what they can do to help. And I think what, the point you're making about the fact that everybody has different talents and tools is important for people to understand that you're, everyone is unique in that sense. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm living proof that you don't have to be a techie genius to be part of this campaign, right? Exactly. I can't even use me either. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and it's... It's very, very significant because, you know, the abandonment of Chelsea Manning by the anti-war movement. This is a member of the U.S. military who non-violently resisted. Yeah. You, can bet, you can bet that every other soldier who's contemplating, contemplating resisting, not redeploying to Afghanistan and Iraq, was watching that case and seeing how much 
this anti-war movement that incited them to resist would deliver on solidarity, and we failed. We failed to support military resistance in the first Gulf War, and more serious resistance, non-violent resistance, came out of the US military than out of the US peace movement. I was the longest serving prisoner, civilian prisoner of the first Gulf War in the United States. I did 13 months. Um, but there were 200 soldiers who were sentenced to six months to six years, you know. And so if you're going to march, what you're doing is inciting people to nonviolently resist. And when you do that, you're obligated to accompany them through the courts and through the consequences, should that be jail or whatever. So, um, and Julian knows about solidarity. If Julian didn't know about solidarity, Edward Snowden would be in chains today. The Guardian that left him is... in Hong Kong. The Guardian exploited him and left him in Hong Kong. You know. Please and, tell um, that story. I know too many, too little people, too few people understand that story. Please tell us about that. If you watch Citizen Four, that won the Oscar, or not, I watched it. You see a man who thinks he's going from a hotel room to jail for the rest of his life. Right? He didn't. He didn't have a next step, you know, and it was Julian and Sarah Harrison, specifically Sarah, who saved Edward Snowden from that fate. And that's not referred to in the Olive Stone movie, which is based on the Luke Harding. Luke Harding has got very wealthy out of shit attacks on Julian Assange. It's it's disgusting. (laughs) It really is. It really is disgusting. And, um, you know, they're so cynical and they're all, they hate Julian because he's, He's a hippie kid. He went to 37 schools. He moved around. These guys all jumped through the hoops of Oxford and Cambridge. There's a class hatred for Julian Assange. There's a cultural hatred. But the British elite hate Australians. We're, we're considered as direct, obnoxious, egalitarian. We don't have any consciousness or respect for their class system, you know. Like when you're over here in England, people are continually sizing you up. Are you worth talking to? Where do you exist in relation to me? Are you more important, less important? Australians will always give you a go. You know, they'll always talk, generally talk to anybody. If they think you're a dickhead, they mightn't talk to you a second. Yeah, they, they may know. not be like, you know, overly uh, polite about it, but yeah, exactly. No, this, this culture is so ridden with class obsession uh, and that they hate him for cultural reasons, class reasons, and also, you know, well, I was talking to a Guardian feature writer and I was positing this theory and he said, no, nah. he said, it's more significant than that. He said, what journalists value is being the gatekeeper of secrets. Who gets to know, when they get to know, how much they get to know. And WikiLeaks comes along with the primary data, throws it up in the air and goes, you work it out, you know. So um, that that's a generalisation as well. And I had an experience, I was vigiling, um, me and Ben Griffin were doing a speaking gig in Brighton. An Irish punk rocker friend had put on. He's a bit worried about numbers. So we went out and held a band that said, free Manning, free Assange, end the wars. And this guy comes around the corner and starts screaming at me about Julian. And I said, you know, what's your fucking problem, mate? Are you a Guardian reader? And he just stopped and fled. And then the Irish guy goes, don't you know who that is? And I said, no. And he said, Nick Davies. <laughs> so how random was that? So he wasn't just the Guardian reader, he was their main guy, you know, who wrote who collaborated with WikiLeaks and uh and turned on them. And um so yeah, there you go. It's the small world. And returning just for a moment to the to the whole uh Snowden saga we were just talking about, um another aspect of that that um that people need to know about is the fact that not only did Julian Assange actively um, aid Edward Snowden and, you know, I, you know, he basically saved Edward Snowden, Sarah Harrison specifically, uh, as you said, but the fact is that uh, because of that, because of his support for Snowden, Julian Assange um, was denied uh, um, basically a pathway to an end to his situation. And so that is an incredible amount of, um, you know, repercussions that he suffered because he helped Snowden. And so I think that I, I just wanted to ask, because you're a friend of Julian, you know, can you speak to his selflessness or the, or the way that he is um, unwilling to not help a whistleblower um, even when it is detrimental to his own situation? Yeah, I mean, Julian is, is kind of characterised as arrogant, elitist, some kind of alien, hyper-intelligent life form that's landed or Krypton or something, you know. Now, a, a good piece of resource is to look at that film Underground in Australia. And I went to every DVD store I passed when I was back in Australia. There's not one copy of that film. 
And that shows you a couple of things. One is he's from pretty humble beginnings, you know, and two, he's been an anti-war activist for 30 years, you know. Um, so try as they best as they do the Guardian to present him as, you know, and some of the attacks are incredibly childish, like incredibly, like yeah. prime, high school, can... primary school bullshit, you know. So, you know, I find him, um, like I took Chelsea Manning's aunt and uncle into me, Julie, and I think that's the first time the Assange has met the Mannings. And um, I was sort of worried, you know, they're, they're very good Welsh working class people and obviously, you know, we can, we can <laughs> they're pretty high for intelligent. I mean, a lot of their stuff goes way over my head and I'm thinking, oh, I hope this meeting rolls along socially okay, you know, and um, yeah. it went for two hours. They had a great time. And then the next day they flew off to visit Chelsea in jail. And um, they received no support from the British anti-war movement. Like, I went up there after Chelsea was sentenced and um, met them. And there'd been an initial approach which totally backfired, you know, with the attitude of what can we do for us rather than what can we do for you. And I said, look, we got to go to Dublin. Like, they're in Pembrokeshire, Wales. Dublin's closer than London. And they, I said, the Irish know a bit about solidarity. We've been through a bit, you know. So... Um, we went over two months later. Jerry Conlon, who sadly passed away since from the Guildford Four, did 16 years in jail for um, something he didn't do. Had the same lawyer as Julian, Gareth Pierce, played by Daniel Day-Lewis in The Name of the Father. Um, he came down from Belfast to speak out for Julian and Chelsea. Uh, it was the first time the, the, the Chelsea's mother's family was with a large group of people that had supported what Chelsea had done. This is three or four years into jail after the sentencing. And then within six weeks, uh, we took a lot of Irish musicians and Donald O'Kelly, Kelly, the great Irish actor, playwright, to Habitford West. And we had a knees up Kaylee there, you know. And then that happened about six times that they'd come over to Dublin. And for the family who'd been so weighed down and attacked and raided by the FBI in the beginning, um, it was such good thing for their spirits, you know. And... Uh, and, you know, sadly, Kevin, Chelsea's uncle, died and, and friends from Dublin went to the funeral, Joe Black and others. And uh, so it's been a great relationship with Susan and um, and the others, you know. So it's very human, you know. Like I know when I was in jail, it was very comforting to know that good people were around my parents and all that. So, yeah. Um, so Julian, yeah. So, you know, uh, I find him self-depreciating in terms of humour. Um, and good company and, uh, you know, concerned about how I'm doing and how other people are doing. Uh, it's not all about him, you know, as the Guardian would like to present him as a narcissist. It's no, so much not all about him that he risks so much to save Edward Snowden. You know. Exactly. And that's the side that people don't see. And and even uh, as he's been isolated completely, he was writing letters about other journalists that were suffering and had gone missing. He just never seems to actually, you know, um, you know, be self-centered in any way with his advocacy. He's always, um, from what we can see from the outside, he seems to be always advocating for other people, like WikiLeaks in their, in their advocating for Chelsea Manning constantly from the day she was um, uh, arrested. So, Yeah. And, um, yeah, it'd be nice to get some of that solidarity back, Chelsea, if you're listening. <laughs> but, yeah. but, um, but, you know, you've got to realise... Um, if you watch Underground, which is a very simple thing to do um, compared to reading lots of stuff, uh, you see that Julian has been through the mill. At 17, he's charged with 32 offences. The Pentagon are pursuing him. And he's been through the mill of betrayal, you know, of former uh, comrades or allies turning on him. So he's well seasoned, you know. He's going into this experience, which is uh, like none other I've seen anyone go through. Uh, he's he's well seasoned from his experience as a teenager, and he's he's bright, he's calm, he's considered. Um, uh, there's some thought that just went through my head there, but now it's gone. I think. Um, yeah. So I think. Oh yeah, this is what I'd like to say. <laughs> when in 2010, when I was reading about him getting in trouble or read, even before he got, when he was doing his thing, I thought, I think this is a guy in human history that has pissed off the most amount of powerful people in the shortest amount of time, right? Exactly. I, you know. 
And as we head towards the end of this segment, um, what are the final thoughts you want to express to the audience on Julian, on the situation right now, on what they can do? Any any thoughts that we haven't covered that you'd like to get out there? Okay, the like war is constant. War on the poor is constant, and it's um, it doesn't end neatly and begin neatly. And when I was growing up, I grew up on the my back fence still shares a fence with the second largest army base in Australia, Gallipoli Barracks, Anogra, the Aboriginal word. And uh, my mother had three uncles who went through that base from northern Queensland to the Somme, you know. And when I was growing up, uh, during the Vietnam War, they were deploying to Vietnam. Now they've been deploying to Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. So, you know, for my mother, uh, from when I was growing up in the 60s, they wanted your firstborn son. They had conscription, Right. All they want you to do now is to look the other way. All they want you to do is avert your gaze. Now, Chelsea Manning, that's all Chelsea Manning had to do in Baghdad, is look the other way, away from war crimes, not hear the screams that they're dying, you know. And um, that's the why, as I think as Kim.com was saying before, why they find WikiLeaks so threatening is uh, it brings us, you know, to the realities that can't be covered up by Disneyland or Hollywood or whatever. The reality is the American empire. Now, I'm I'm from an American movement. Catholic work started in New York and New York City in 1933 during the Depression. I'm not anti-American. I spent four years there and enjoyed it. I'm anti-imperialist, okay? And whether it's a British empire or an American empire or an Italian or Egyptian or Japanese or Chinese empire, it's empire is the problem, you know? And Gore Vidal, the great American liberal kept calling the United States back from empire to being a republic. You know, that would be an improvement. But um, I think we're, uh, you know, you can either turn, what we're experiencing is a zombification of civil society where people are switched off, switched, switched off, and we're obviously distracted uh, constantly. So but, well, they want us heavily sedated and distracted and, uh, it's whether you want to be a human being or not, you know, and whether you want to live with empathy for the other or not. And we're in a culture that is combating empathy. And um, uh, so, you know, it's about how do you want to live your three score and ten, you know? Do you want to live exactly. like a human being or do you want to live like a human being? And um, responding to, this, to Julian Assange and all the victims he has risked his liberty for is um, the test of that. Exactly. And I think that is a fantastic, fantastic sentiment uh, to end this segment with. Thank you so much, Kieran. And after this, uh, the stream is, has ended, I will try to get the, the uh, links and information out to people as fast Great. as possible. Thank you again. And, 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 you know, I hope that people really tune into your Twitter uh, feed to just just uh, be inspired by the work that you all do. So yeah, thank I'll, you so much. I'll, uh, I'll tweet from the vigil about three times. Okay. okay. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.